starting the program now uh, president of the all india bank employees association comrade rajan nagar uh, madam indra jay singh office bearers of the aiba today's coordinator uh, madam lalita joshi comrade lalita joshi and all the participants uh, good evening to all of you and welcome to the 25th seminar uh, of this uh, series today and uh, this is being held uh, to celebrate the bank nationalization anniversary and when there are attacks on bank uh, public sector character we thought we will have such a program invite very eminent people and uh, get their views and inputs so that we can uh, campaign on those matters with better awareness among the people and also take the message to the common people so that our struggle will be more effective and informed and with that uh, we have this uh, program we are very happy that uh, you kindly accepted our invitation despite your busy schedule we welcome you and uh, uh, the audience is uh, bank employees all over the country are also other people economists and other friends of the all india bank employees association it is going live not only in zoom but also in facebook twitter and also in uh, youtube of the aba that way a lot of people are uh, uh, lucky enough to hear you today and this is the first time that uh, we have you in the aba platform so we are extremely happy about that uh, good evening madam now i request uh, comrade lalita joshi the joint secretary of the all india bank employees association and she is in charge of the uh, women bank employees cell of the all india bank employees association at the national level she is also Uh, the negotiating uh, member of the aba team discussing with the iba on our uh, wages service condition etc we are happy that she will uh, coordinate the program today and uh, with this i 
hand over the <coughs> mic to comrade lalita joshi to go ahead thank you comrade uh, respected president of aiba comrade rajan nagar respected general secretary comrade ch venkata chalam our guest speaker respected madam indra jay singh my colleague office bearers of all india bank employees association Ooh. present here senior uh, leaders present here guest participants and all my participants a warm welcome to all of you for this webinar program comrades this webinar is a month long series of programs which we are having every day we are having one as you are all aware now we are coming to the last week of the webinar the main purpose is to commemorate the 52nd anniversary of bank nationalization this is the time while steering to our experts we rededicate ourselves to the cause of public sector banking in and banking in uh, public sector in general and public sector banking in particular at the same time we also are aware that our beloved organization all india bank employees association has completed 75 years i am sure all of you agree that this organization has imbibed in us has inculcated in us an ideology where we do not think only for the welfare of the employees but also for the welfare of the state through pro people policies in the financial sector and strengthening the public sector banking so hearing all the experts from various fields i am sure all of us all the participants have broadened their canvas and will look at the campaign program in a more with a more broader outlook our organization has always taught us to work for all class oriented struggles and that we will continue to do so after hearing all the inputs from all of you madam indra jay singh today is our guest speaker she was born in the year 1940 she has completed her master in law in the year 1962 i would say it was before i was born way back in 1962 she completed her masters in law in the year 1986 she went on to be designated as a seen first woman to be designated as a senior advocate in the high court of bombay then in the year 2005 she received the padma shri from the president of india in the year 2009 again she was the first woman additional solicitor general of india in the year 2018 she was the ranked 20th out of 50 in the fortune magazine not greatest leader of the country but 20th ranking was amongst the greatest leaders of the world out of 50 in fortune magazine and we are really fortunate to have her here today she has Uh, been known to be a very active her legal uh, activism is mainly in human rights and for gender equality we have seen to name some of a few some of a few of the her cases one is the famous geeta hariharan case where the supreme court ruled she has argued the case and the supreme court ruled that the mother also can be a natural guardian and the children can bear the mother's name she also fought and she argued the case for compensation for the gopal gas strategy victims against the multinational american company union carbide she also represented homeless pavement dwellers of mumbai who faced eviction she was on the team of the united nations committee in the in the committee of elimination against discrimination for of women so these are just some of the few cases which i have named and definitely if i can go on and on but we are not here to listen to me we are here to listen to madam indra jay singh and i welcome indra jay singh today she will be talking on the topic privatization and its impact on constitutional provisions madam indra jay singh thank you uh, can you hear me yes madam okay uh first of all i wish to thank you for this opportunity uh of saying a few words uh before you uh you can see i'm as old if not older than your own constitution of this association 
And as Lalita Ji rightly pointed out, uh, even before she was born, uh, I was already in the field of uh, law. And uh, it's so in a certain sense, I, I should say I feel a sense of identity uh, with organizations like yours. Uh, we, I don't, this is going to be a little personal, but I have often referred to myself as one of Midnight's children. It is that people like me, and I'm sure many of your leadership have inherited the values of the freedom movement. Uh, we were born with the legacy of the freedom movement, which was given to us as a gift. And some of us are old enough to remember that legacy and to treasure it. Uh, this might be, it might be important to mention this because generations that who have come after us have been born in eras which we call the era of liberalization. For example, if you trace liberalization to the year 1991, I'm sure in our midst, we have a lot of people who were born after 1991. And sometimes I feel sorry for them that they never ever lived through, actually lived through a period in which we believed in the socialism that the Indian constitution has bequeathed to us. Uh, considering that this is the 42nd, 52nd anniversary of the bank nationalization case, I remember uh, distinctly uh, being a witness to some of the arguments in the court uh, when the challenge to bank nationalization was being argued uh, by Mr. the late Mr. Palkiwala. And uh, the, it's a celebrated case known as the R.C. Cooper case. Uh, where, where the bank nationalization was actually upheld uh, subject to payment of compensation. As practicing lawyers, we refer to the R.C. Cooper case again and again because it is one of the very initial cases which said that fundamental rights must be viewed as a whole. In other words, the Constitution is an organic document. You cannot dissect the Constitution of India. You cannot say, <coughs> well, you know, this portion refers to liberalization and privatization. This portion refers to socialism. This portion refers to fundamental rights. This portion refers to a directive principles of state policy. No. It was that case which laid down for the first time that you need to look at the constitution as an organic document, just as a human being is a whole human being. Similarly, the constitution is a whole constitution. It is a living, breathing document, which has to respond to the challenges of our times. But my question would be, is there a running thread to the Constitution of India with which we can identify and with which we can identify, with which we can say, this is the identity of the Indian Constitution. What is that identity of the Indian Constitution? so that all the decisions we take, whether it's a decision to privatize or not privatize, whether it's a decision to uh, challenge something or not challenge something, what are those basic values on the basis of which we will take these decisions? This is where our understanding of the constitution being an organic whole comes into the picture. And that's where the story of the constitution has to begin. And, uh, uh, that's where this issue that we are discussing today has to begin and end. Nothing, but nothing can happen uh, in the matter of governance 
which is outside the framework of the Constitution. If we bear this in mind, then answers to the questions which arise in our mind will become simpler. So what we need to understand is, as I told you, the framers of the Constitution had their own aspirations of a truly free India, freedom from what? Freedom from poverty, freedom from inequality, freedom from economic slavery, freedom, I would argue, from the threat of neocolonialism as well. The concepts of social and economic justice have been recognized as desirable national goals of India, and they have been enshrined in the constitution. Now, as I said, what is the running threat? So let me tell you what I think is the running threat. The, it is the preamble. It is the preamble of the Indian constitution, which aims at securing justice, social, economic, and political for all its citizens. The primacy of these objectives can be observed from what several academics have said about the Indian constitution. They say that the Indian constitution is first and foremost a social document. The, this is Glanville Austin. The majority of its provisions are either directly aimed at furthering the goals of social revolution or attempt to foster this revolution by establishing the conditions necessary for its achievement. Yet despite the permeation of the entire constitution by this aim of national renaissance, the core of the commitment to the social revolution lies in part one and four. That is the fundamental rights and the directive principles of state policy. These are the conscience of the constitution, close quote. Now, we must understand the magnitude of this statement made by Glanville Austin. He talks about the conscience of the constitution. More recent judgments have talked about the morality of the constitution of India, what we call constitutional morality. Many people have disputed this and said, there's nothing known as constitutional morality. We argue that the constitutional morality lies in the preamble, the fundamental rights, and the directive principles of state policy. And for our judgment, for our discussion today, it is these three provisions of the constitution that will have to give us an answer to the question, privatization, question mark. What kind of privatization? What regulations should a private company be subjected to? What obligations does a private company have to the people of this country? Now, it is here that you must understand that there is a sharp distinction between the obligations of the public sector and the obligations of the private sector as they exist today. Moving from obligations, let's go to accountability. There is also a sharp difference between the accountability of the public sector and the accountability of the private sector. To put it very bluntly, the accountability of the public sector is 100% to the people of the country and the accountability of the private sector is 0% to the people of this country. Why do I say that? I say it because in constitutional theory, fundamental rights do not apply to the private sector. Please remember that. When you're discussing the privatization of banks, what is the biggest issue that we will come up against? Yes, I know there are issues of bad loans. There are issues of the taxpayers' money being used to private ends. There are issues of companies going insolvent, banking companies going insolvent. There are issues of depositors whose entire life savings have been washed away. But the biggest issue is when all this happens, 
a public sector bank is still accountable. A, a private sector bank is not accountable. We will be told that the relationship between us and a private sector bank is one of contract. But the relationship between us and the public sector is not one of contract. It's a constitutional relationship. It's a relationship of governance. It's a relationship of accountability. And when it comes to the public sector, whether it's banks, whether it's coal, whether it's mines, it doesn't matter what it is, each and every one of these activities can be subjected to the scrutiny of our courts at the instance of one single individual, one single citizen can come and say, this is arbitrary, this is unfair, this is unequal, this is unjust. Now, having pointed to these major differences, let's look at how our courts have dealt with these issues. Uh, there is a string of judgments uh, of the court, and I will not trouble you with, the citations of those judgments where this issue of nationalization when challenge has been upheld. The first of them, I've already told you, was the bank nationalization case itself, R.C. Cooper. We've had cases of Minerva Mills where the Supreme Court has said nationalization of the mills is in public interest. <laughs> So, as I said, from what I've said, it's obvious that India's constitution envisages a welfare state in its very provisions. The provisions are found, the preamble itself uses the word socialist, at least until now. We don't know when it will be amended and removed, but it's not impossible to visualize a time when it will be removed by way of amendment by a brute majority in parliament. But we actually claim that we are a mixed economy, which includes features of socialism and capitalism. And this is the public policy of India. The Supreme Court has often said that the principal aim of socialism is to eliminate inequality of income and standards of life and to provide a decent standard of life to working people. The socialist concept of society must be implemented in its true spirit and in the, in the light of provisions of the Constitution. Now, this, I'm quoting the Supreme Court. Now, of course, the public sector banks and the move to nationalize them in 1971, as I've already told you, was a move in public interest to meet the aspirations of the ordinary people opening branches in remote parts of the country, reducing cyclical dependence on private moneylenders. Public sector banks represent an irreplaceable social good for millions in this country. Therefore, I would argue that any move to privatize these banks is an anti-people policy, an anti-poverty measure, and does not represent the values of Indian democracy or of the Constitution of India. I'm sure your pre previous speakers have said much about these issues to you and have maybe got into the micro details of these issues, but I'm trying to give you an overarching constitutional approach to these issues. Uh, the government's stated aim in privatizing seems to be that they want to protect the money of the taxpayer, but there is such a huge mismatch between the aim and the method that they are using to do this, privatization is not the way to protect the taxpayer's money. The problem solution mismatch is evident. Private banks are not the answer to our problems, of, to the problem of economic offenders, which is the claim made by the government that we are doing it to, to be able to get to the economic offenders. Instead, they pose a bigger threat to this country, as big a threat as the economic offenders themselves. Uh, this is obvious from the crisis in the US in, triggered in 2008 by the management of the private sector, the spillover effect of which 
was so big that could, it could have uh, demolished the monarch economy of the US unless the government bailed the banks out. This is, this is an important point for you to remember. Whenever in a capitalist economy, there is either mismanagement or fraud or monopolization, who bails them out? It is the government that bails them out. So once again, it's the taxpayer's money which goes into these bailouts. And that was obvious in the year 2008 in the United States of America as well. The social cost of privatization is even worse than its economic costs, uh, whereby inhuman loan recovery methods are used for small loans where big loan defaulters can see their loans written off under some assumed policy of reconstruction. A significant proportion of our population today relies on scheme devised by the public sector banks to ensure an accurate and secure line of credit. The cost of privatizing public sector banks will be social and human cost. Now, coming back to the directive principles of state policy, codified in Article 36 to 51 of the Constitution, it captures the policies that can help us reach a just society free from economic and social inequality and injustice. Article 38 and 39 specifically direct the state to take measures to reduce economic inequality, guarantee the common good, and ensure the ownership of public goods results in maximizing public welfare. This I'm reading from the Constitution. This is not something that I am saying. I think one of the problems that we face in India today <laughs> is that we have stopped believing in our own Constitution. What can you say about a country which doesn't believe in its own constitution? What can you say when those in charge of governance stop believing in their own constitution? How can you explain the fact that a vision document in the constitution, which says that its aim and goal is to reduce economic inequality and guarantee the common good, goes off and says, now we are going to sell off the country's national resources, whether they're banks, whether they're mines, whether they're airports, whether they're docks, all of these have been collectively owned. You must remember one thing, the national resources of the country are held in trust by the government for the public good. And what you're seeing in front of your eyes is the giving away of national resources through all these means into private hands. And this is why it becomes important, your campaign uh, to uh, oppose privatization of public sector banks has constitutional backing and acquires a constitutional dimension. In case after case, in Sanjeev Koch, the Supreme Court said, quote, ownership while upholding nationalization, ownership, control, and distribution of national productive wealth for the benefit and use of the community and the rejection of a system of misuse of its resources for selfish ends is what socialism is about. Again, in 2003, the government decided to sell the majority shares of Hindustan Petroleum Corporation and Bharat Petroleum to private parties. The Center for Public Interest Education countered this as violation of com constitutional promise of socialism in practice. Although courts were reluctant to uphold this view, they held that these bodies were explicitly acquired with the view to promote socialism. So any disinvestment might must comply with the present statute. Now, fundamental rights frameworks creates a set of enforceable rights enjoyed by citizens. And the question that will arise for our consideration is, can these fundamental rights 
of citizens be used to stop this kind of gross frittering away of our national resources. We all know that the era of liberalization in India began in 1991. We said we were opening up the economy to the private sector. We allowed private sector banks, private sector insurance, and the results are there for all to see. Privatization can lead to monopolies. And monopolies have a power which goes beyond their economic power. They acquire the power to profess policy for the nation as a whole. And unfortunately, India does not have a strong monopolies and restrictive trade practices regime, as you see in other capitalist countries. So what do we have in India? The worst of both worlds, where we are unable to restrain rogue capitalism, and crony capitalism through the lack of devices which will help us to rein in the misuse of capital. If you turn once again to the constitution itself, it tries to achieve a balance between fundamental rights and the directive principles of state policy. I would say that in the early years of this country, this balance was struck. But as we moved on after 2019, there's a definite prioritization of a balance in favor of the private sector as compared to the balance in favor of the common good. I have found this reflected most tellingly on issues like, for example, education. It was for the first time in the TMA, we have all been brought up to believe that education is a public good. It's a sacred trust. It is something that is done in the public interest. It is the function of the state to provide adequate education. It is not a business, but for the first time, in the TMA Pike case, we saw the Supreme Court of India say that education is a business and an occupation. And therefore, the TMA Pike group of educational institutions, including medical institutions, etc., would run their institutions without government interference as a fundamental right to carry on trade, business, and occupation. So I would say that from that time onwards, we have seen a very sharp change in the decision-making of the Supreme Court of India in favor of privatization, all in the name of fundamental rights. Whose fundamental rights? The fundamental right of the businessman to run his or her business. In later years, a small attempt was made in the modern dental college case to once again draw attention to the fact that private educational institutions also needed to have a publicly transparent and accountable system of admission and a cap on the fees that they charge. Once again, it was an attempt to balance the directive principles of state policy and the fundamental rights. This framework now of this balance between directive principles and fundamental right is being threatened by the kind of policies that the current government is adopting and policies that we will see being adopted 
in the near future. As against this, I would like to present the example of the government of Delhi, which made a magnificent effort to upgrade education at the primary school level in their public schools. And today, children want to go to a public school in Delhi because it is as good, if not better, than a private school. So what does the story tell us? It, we can do it if we have the will to do it. If we have the will to ensure that the public sector func functions and is a welcoming space, we can do it. What is missing, therefore, is the political will. As I said, liberalization and free markets inevitably result in monopolies, and monopolies are not subject to any form of genuine regulation. Efforts at regulating monopolies in this country have notoriously failed. And this is the reason why the rich have got richer while the poor get poorer. So <laughs> I'm going to briefly end, but there is a point I wish to make. I, I would uh, want to draw your attention to the fact that the lust for privatization has gone so far that today, I am witnessing demands for privatization in the sense of hands off by the government from the regulation of temple trusts also. There are petitions pending in the Supreme Court. There are books written on why temples should not be regulated uh, by any statute. And the Community should be left free to run temples, all in the name of freedom of religion. In the first place, temples were brought under Public Trust Act because of the gross mismanagement that was obvious in the running of temples. But now I want to make a point that we see like a marriage between the ideology of privatization, the Hindutva ideology of the ruling party, and coupled with a very, very authoritarian way of dealing with its citizenry. Today, if you raise your voice, you will be called either an anti-national person. I won't be surprised if you who demand that there should be no privatization of public sector banks will be called as people who are anti-national. It's a favorite uh, formulation of today's government. And many of us this, who have raised issues of freedom of speech and expression have found ourselves at the wrong end of the law, ended up being described as terrorists or as anti-national people or people who are guilty of sedition. Remember that a threat to the economic security of India is considered an act of terrorism. In 2008, the government amended the prevention of a uh, uh, Unlawful Activities Act and introduced a threat to the economic security of India as an act of terrorism. Now, I leave it to your imagination to decide who is posing this threat to the economic security of India. I'm going to make one last point and leave it at that. And that is, I, I will refer to the recent pandemic that this country has seen 
course, it's a worldwide phenomenon. But I think what this pandemic has shown up is the dangers of a privatized health sector. There is no functioning public health sector in the country. Yes, the primary health centers, which ought to have been strengthened, have not been strengthened. Health insurance is privatized. Hospitals are privatized. And the consequences of that we saw during COVID. When it comes to monopolies, have you ever asked yourself the question, why only two companies in India have been licensed to produce the vaccine, the Serum Institute and Bharat Biotech. Why were more licenses not issued for the production of vaccine? Why are they not issued even today? So privatization, liberalization and monopolies go hand in hand with the most devastating consequences for ordinary people, ordinary citizens. I'm going to end this by saying it's ironic that a country which you would say is an epitome of a capitalist economy, United States of America, gives to all its citizens vaccination free of charge. And India, which claims to be a socialist democratic republic is making its citizens pay for the vaccination that they are getting. So this leaves me with a very confused question in my mind to which there are no easy answers as far as I'm concerned, namely, what, what are we? Uh, what is our constitutional vision? I began by telling you that there was a vision a vision inherited from the independence movement. But I'm going to end by telling you that I find myself confused. If I look at the constitution for guidance, I'm unable to match theory with practice. And I find that a lot of things I see around me are outside the framework of the Indian constitution. And yet, it's difficult to challenge these policies and practices in a court of law. I would just like to end by saying perhaps the only solution or the fundamental solution is the kind of movement that you have started by doing these series of webinars, a sort of a public awareness raising and a consciousness raising and maybe a definite political vision of what we would like this country to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. It was a very, uh, not only interesting uh, lecture, but very educative and uh, thought-provoking also. A uh, lot of Indians are equally perplexed now about uh, what we understand as constitution and what is really going on. Everything is completely topsy-turvy. So even particularly our younger generation, they all believe in honesty. They all believe in hard work. They want to come up in life. They want uh, a prosperous India. They want to help everybody. But when they see the situation around, same question, uh, confusion comes that where are we to? So I, I think uh, we have echoed uh, the views of uh, the uh, people of our country in these lines and definitely we'll find a solution. We, as AIBA, believe that there is no alternative to India uh, to the path than uh, going towards the uh, left of center, people orientation, welfare state. That's how during freedom struggle that was thought of and that should be the thing. We are uh, totally committed to that. And we are extremely happy that you also share such uh, wonderful concerns 
and we are very confident that there will be more occasions in future to work together. We shall come to you for more interactions and uh, guidance and help also. Uh, it was wonderful having you with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, I request uh, Commander Lalita Joshi to formally propose a word of thanks. Thank you, Madam. Uh, your inputs uh, have really been very thought-provoking for all of us. Definitely, uh, you have incentivized us by saying that our struggle has constitutional backing and you have also raised pertinent questions which the government's policies have to answer. And we are indeed very thankful to hear you and uh, each, all the participants have definitely gained a lot from this deliberation. I thank you once again and I thank all the participants who have heard and I'm sure we have a long way to go. We have a long struggle to go. In this, we are also seeking support from the legal fraternity to help us in our cause, to support us in our cause, to be with us in our cause. I would only say working class struggle long live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And uh, before we end the program today, as usual, uh, we just announced that tomorrow, uh, Monday, it will be the 26th uh, webinar. Uh, it will be at 7 o'clock. Saturday, Sunday, we have at 4. Tomorrow, weekday, it will be at 7 o'clock. So we can join by 6.30. And tomorrow's lecture also will be very, very important. It will be by a senior economist, Professor Nawal Kishore Chaudhary from uh, Bihar, from Patna. He's a very experienced uh, economist. And he will be talking about the political economy of bank nationalization, the context, the present position, and the challenges ahead. So it will be very, very, I mean, closely related to what we are uh, talking about and what we are campaigning for. So I request all of you to kindly come back for tomorrow's program uh, for this wonderful lecture. And uh, it, it will be very, very interesting to hear uh, Professor uh, Chaudhary. So with this, uh, thank you very much. With the permission of our President, uh, Kamal Rajan Nagar, and once again, thanking uh, Madam, we close uh, today's program. Good evening and